Okay, so today's topic is uh, ischemic stroke diagnosis and management. As you all know, the stroke is first seen by a physician or a family physician. And so it is extremely important to know about stroke, the proper way to diagnose and manage. Because only after the patient sees their own family doctor or the consulting physician, they come to a neurologist for special care. So I start with uh, ischemic stroke. It is the second most common cause of mortality after ischemic heart disease. And more important than mortality is the morbidity, the disability. See, in myocardial infarction, they are either here or there. And they are not bedridden unless in extreme cases of CCF and all that. But the problem with hemiplegia as a stroke is the disability. Most senior citizens, when they come to my OPD, with some non-specific symptoms of jum jum sensation in the hand, the numbness in the hand, going on for one month, two months. Their main concern is that, doctor, I don't want to be disabled. I don't want to be dependent. I am worried about stroke. Then I reassure them, stroke strikes suddenly. It doesn't give you email or mail a post or something like that. If you are going to get a stroke, it will come suddenly. It won't come to you like I have got jum jum sensation for the last one month. Is it a stroke? 100% that jum jum sensation is not stroke. I think it's very important to reassure the patients that anything happens in the body on one side, they are always scared about the stroke. So the problem with uh, ischemic cerebral stroke is about the disability rather than the mortality. Now, so almost one third of the patients are younger, below the age of 65 years, and two thirds of strokes, as usual, occur in developing countries because we are all more populated. Now, the commonest type of stroke is the ischemic stroke, which is about 80 to 85 percent. Now, how do you define stroke? As I said, stroke strikes suddenly. So, in terms of medical words, it is acute onset of focal neurological deficit due to a cerebrovascular cause, either ischemia or hemorrhage. So, there are two important points. One is a sudden onset. Another is a focal neurological deficit. The commonest is the hemiparesis or hemiplegia. And due to a vessel problem, either the blockage of vessel ischemia or the rupture of a vessel that is hemorrhage. This is very interesting. The brain weight is only 2% of body weight. It is 1.5 kg. But it requires 20% of cardiac output. Because the brain is dependent on oxygen, glucose, second to second. It doesn't have a storing capacity like muscle. It has to be given continuous supply. And so 20% of cardiac output goes for an organ which is only one and a half kg body weight. Now what are the types of stroke? The first one is the transient ischemic attack which I am talking to you now. Then comes the ischemic attack, ischemic infarction. So the ischemia can cause transient ischemic attack or a crescendo stroke that means there is a weakness which becomes worse after one hour, which becomes still worse after one hour. So it is a crescendo stroke or a gradually progressive evolving stroke. A patient may get admitted with the right upper limb weakness at which time his speech is normal, he is walking. But when you come back for rounds after two hours, you find his leg is also weak. So it is an evolving stroke. Then transient ischemic attack, now this is given up. Then there is a completed stroke. Either it is a minor deficit of completed stroke or it is a dense hemiplegia. Then the third variety of uh, stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke where there is a bleeding into the brain. Now let us discuss first about the transient ischemic attack which is of utmost importance but unfortunately neglected by the patient, the relatives and the doctor. Now, what is the definition of transient ischemic attack? The word transient 
but means it is a short lived and attack due to lack of blood supply to a particular part of the brain so earlier the tia was defined defined as a neurological deficit which lasts less than 24 hours but generally it lasts actually less than 1 hour but what happened after the advent of uh, neuroimaging clinically we have made a diagnosis of tia that means a patient wakes up in the morning he is unable to walk he has got a right sided weakness with difficulty he is able to get into the car with assistance then he comes to the casualty 30 minutes are lapsed at that time he is completely normal so there is no neurological problem at all if by chance if he becomes normal before he enters the car they may not come to a doctor at all they will say oh, everything has become normal there is no need to go but even though the clinical diagnosis is tia up to 50% of them have a mri evidence of a tissue injury so tia is supposed to be a physiological dysfunction with a total recovery but imaging shows there is a structural damage so now the new definition is transient episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal brain spinal cord retinal ischemia without acute infarction that means clinically it is a transient hemiparesis mr scan is normal then you diagnose it as a tia why so much of uh, oh, uh, emphasis on diagnosis of transient ischemic attack as i said it is neglected by the patient the relatives and the doctor the importance is it is a warning sign of the nature that they are going to develop a total hemiplegia the incidence is as high as 11% over the next 7 days now that is the importance of recognizing a tia and investigating because if you say oh everything is all right you go home nothing to worry and all that they will come back with a dense hemiplegia over the next 7 days that is the importance of making a proper diagnosis of tia now how do we diagnose as i said by the time the patient comes to us already he is totally normal from the history of some speech disturbance weakness of upper limb lower limb ataxic disorder difficulty to talk disoriented unable to see like hemianopia if the language area is affected they have got difficulty in naming and expressing the speech so all these are there and that's why they have been referred to a doctor but by the time they come they will completely normal this is an emergency to identify and prevent a major stroke now examination by the time the patient comes to us the neurological exam may be totally normal but you make a quick examination to see whether there is any hemiparesis in neurologically any language dysfunction vision motor and all then you run through a short but specific investigations like routine ones and then a specific investigation of it mr brain and imaging of the neck vessels so whenever you suspect a transient ischemic attack we expect the mr brain should be normal but as i said clinically taa but there may be a structural damage to the brain which only confirms that the patient has improved but it is a definite taa or should we admit the patient many times the doctor themselves say that everything is all right you go home control your bp sugar everything will be fine the patient also is very happy to go back home but there are some indications where you should admit the patient why do you want to admit patient is totally recovered because there is a 11% chance of developing a total hemiplegia over the next 48 72 hours and if the patient is in the hospital he can be immediately thrombolyzed that is the treatment of an infarction which we are coming to so criteria for admission in a taa if symptoms persist beyond 1 hour crescendo taa or anything is abnormal electrolytes hyperglycemia high bp ecg abnormality atrial fibrillation if any of these are abnormal and the carotid stenosis is more than 60% and then for more scientific basis abcd2 score of 3 and above 
Why should you admit, as I said, thrombolysis in the patient develops a ischemic drug? Now, what is this ABCD2? It is a risk stratification. That one point for age above 60, one point for BP above 140, 90, one point for diabetes, two points for unilateral weakness, one point for speech, and the symptom duration less than 10 minutes, which is usual one. So less than 10 minutes is zero, less than 60 minutes, one and two. So total possible score is seven. If the ABCD2 is less than three, there may not be need for admission. But if ABCD score is more than three, patients should be admitted because there's a greater chance of developing total amyptasia. So I think this is a very important point. Identify transient ischemic attack. Don't dismiss them that you are all right, control your BP and go. Check for the stratification of ABCD2 and then make an admission. Now, how do you manage? Immediately you start them on combination of aspirin and clopidogrel. What we give as neurologists generally is 150 milligram. The cardiologist prefers 75 milligram. And combination of aspirin, clopidogrel, two antiplatelet drugs. Anticoagulation only if there is a atrial fibrillation or MI dilated. Some cardiac reason must be there for anticoagulation. Stroke is due to platelet adhesion in the carotid artery. <coughs> anticoagulation does not work. It is only the antiplatelets which work. Anticoagulation for cardiac conditions, you need to do it. And then patient is admitted for control of BP, diabetes, dyslipidemia and all that. When should we do a carotid intervention? Because TAA precedes a stroke. So apart from all these things, how do we intervene the carotid? So this carotid stenosis is 60 to 90 percent, the appropriate carotid artery. If the patient has a left hemiplegia, the right carotid should be more than 60 percent stenosis. In practice, we find patient has a left hemiplegia and a left carotid artery is stenosed, which is not symptomatic. So symptomatic, appropriate carotid artery, 60 to 90 percent. Patient should undergo an intervention, either angioplasty and stenting or endotrectomy. When should it be done? In the second week after TIA. Why? Because the chances of a complete stroke is in the first one or two weeks. We don't do it in the first week because a small tissue damage in the brain, when you open up the blood vessel, may get converted into a hematoma. So we usually don't do it in 48 hours to 72 hours, preferably in the second week. Now, the drugs which are antiplatelet drugs, aspirin, aspirin and aspirin. Such a wonderful drug. It is for headache, it is for backache. It is for pain in the joint, it is for heart attack, and it is for brain attack. Wonderful drug, antiplatelet. Now, the aspirin blocks prostaglandin synthetase action and prevents formation of platelet aggregating thromboxane A2. So, the main function is it prevents platelet adhesion one to one because when the platelets get adhesive, it forms a lump and then it forms a thrombus and then it gets embolized in the stroke. The other are all secondary drugs. All of them are inferior to aspirin. Where aspirin is uh, not tolerated or what is called as aspirin resistance, we use the other drugs. But in the first three months, we use the combination of aspirin, clopidogrel, dual antiplatelet drugs. Ticlopidine came into picture and disappeared because it was not as effective with a lot of side effects. So at the moment, aspirin aspirin and aspirin with clopidogrel in the first three months. Why the first three months? Because the maximum risk of a stroke is in the first three months. Now look at this. Aspirin is rapidly absorbed in the upper GI tract and results in a measurable inhibition of platelet function within 60 minutes. So all senior citizens like me are advised to carry an aspirin tablet in the pocket whenever you travel abroad. You are in the flight, you get some chest discomfort, take one aspirin immediately. Or you find that you are getting a weakness on one side of the body, take an aspirin immediately. It works within 60 minutes. Within 60 minutes. 
though plasma half life of aspirin is only 20 minutes because it the cyclogenase cyclooxygenase is not released by platelets anymore the effect of aspirin is for 10 days very fantastic aspirin it works within 1 hour and it, the action lasts for 10 days that is why whenever a surgery is undertaken we ask them to stop aspirin one week before and restart aspirin after one week because the effect of aspirin lasts for 10 days though in a decreasing measurable quantity there are many more uh, newer anti platelet drugs uh, which are getting into the market asugrel is available ticagrel is available now all these are used when patient has what is called as aspirin resistance on aspirin continues to have some more uh, episodes or they cannot tolerate aspirin many times when you prescribe aspirin the patient will say doctor aspirin causes gastritis i can't take it i said that is a myth that aspirin causes gastritis so i tell them keep the tablet of aspirin on your dining table in the night take your food before you have this curd rice take aspirin take curd rice and then go and wash your hands that is the best way to prevent any such gastritis in inverted commas because the moment they see prescription they will start having gastritis and aspirin is such a life saving drug now apart from aspirin and uh, clopidogrel the dual antiplatelet which is given for 3 months uh, of late it has been found that statin is also very useful to prevent the platelet adhesion and the thrombus formation in addition to dyslipidemia treatment statins are used basically for cholesterol lowering but in addition it has got an effect on the platelets that is why the statin is also used in all patients of tia or a stroke in the first 3 months so first 3 months aspirin clopidogrel and statin either cholesterol is low or high doesn't matter three drugs for 3 months so that is about the tia in my opinion it is the most important one because once the patient has a dense hemiplegia for more than 6 hours there is very little we can help in a dramatic fashion so remember tia transient ischemic attack let this not be in your brain transiently keep this permanently in your brain now we come to ischemic stroke diagnosis stroke is a clinical diagnosis why it is a clinical diagnosis often times patient has a dense hemiplegia he cannot even sit or stand by the time he comes to the casualty he is already able to walk but you cannot say that you have recovered so do go home so it is a clinical diagnosis second important point you will see a dense hemiplegia you ask for a mr scan not infrequently mr scan is normal so you cannot say look here mr scan is normal you don't have hemiplegia it is a hysterical psychogenic no because sometimes a lacunar infarct produces a dense motor hemiplegia and that may not be visible in the mr scan so remember stroke is a clinical diagnosis so step 1 is is it a stroke or a stroke mimic step 2 is okay it is a stroke patient has hemiplegia and uh, i am sure it is a stroke then next question is is it a ischemic stroke that is blockage of blood vessel or it is a bursting of the blood vessel hemorrhagic one because we have treatment available immediately for ischemic stroke but nothing for hemorrhagic stroke but fortunately 85% of strokes are ischemic that means they can be helped very much only about 15% are hemorrhagic the third part is if it is ischemic what is the territory is it a carotid territory or a vertebral vessel attack again you may ask why are you worried about we are worried because carotid intervention stenosis of carotid artery more than 60 70% and appropriate neurological deficit we have to do carotid intervention by stenting or endotracheotomy but at the moment there is no such possibility in vertebral basilar insufficiency we don't do any stenting or endotracheotomy there so it is not only important to know it is a ischemic infarct 
to prevent another infarct if it is in the carotid territory we can do a intervention that is the reason why it is important to find out what territory is that now the first is is it a stroke now most important is hypoglycemia patients with diabetes on treatment they come for hemiparesis and you find the blood glucose is 30 milligrams you give iv glucose the hemiparesis disappears so you don't have to do mr scan angiogram this that and all so hypoglycemia is one part the second is the postictal paresis patients will come with the hemiplegia and if you don't ask the question they won't say the patient had a seizure remember again and again patient will complain of what bothers them more they don't tell about other things you have to ask whether the patient had a seizure and following that the patient has a hemiplegia then it becomes a postictal paresis you don't have to do all those angiogram this that and all occasionally you may see a hemiplegic migraine a patient who has a typical migraine for a number of years now a young chap with migraine now comes with a hemiplegia so it may be a hemiplegic migraine which recovers completely and last but not the least is a space occupied lesion now a couple of uh, uh, examples a 69 year old doctor hypertension diabetes woke up one morning unable to walk to washroom right hemiparesis speech is normal no history of headache vomiting head injury grbs bp normal so i said okay you have got a right hemiparesis due to left cerebral infarction because that is the commonest diagnosis whenever you see hemiparesis we asked for a head injury he said no head injury nothing got a scan done it showed a left subdural hematoma then i asked did you have any time fall in the bathroom then he said yes he slipped in the bathroom 3 months ago got up immediately no head injury it was such a minor fall which he doesn't recognize or doesn't not remember but that minor fall is sufficient for a vein to rupture in the skull and then slowly the blood clot expands 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 and when it reaches a particular size when it presses on the brain the patient develops a hemiparesis so it is very important to know that subdural hematoma is an eminently treatable condition by a simple surgery so i tell the patient that you are lucky because they think oh you are asking me to undergo surgery and you are saying me lucky doctor how is this an infarction or a hemorrhage damages the parenchyma of the brain so the recovery is not always complete whereas a subdural hematoma or extradural hematoma the hematoma is outside the brain but within the skull not in the atmosphere outside the brain but within the skull so the brain is pressed you remove the pressure the brain expands and total recovery so if god asks you look here what is your choice you want subdural with hemiparesis or a stroke with hemiparesis don't hesitate to say immediately subdural with hemiparesis because it is eminently totally recoverable condition with a minor surgery this morning i saw another patient of mine who was having a progressive supranuclear palsy you know that these patients have gait problem he was on syndopa doing well over the last one year this morning he came to me saying that he has got more difficulty in walking so i thought syndopa response is wearing off let me reschedule the syndopa but when i made him to walk remember whenever a patient has a problem you see the problem yourself while he is doing that he has got difficulty in walking ask him to walk no point in examining on the couch so when he started walking i found that he has got a left hemiparesis then he must uh, then he had a few falls obviously the diagnosis was query subdural i advised a brain scan just an hour ago i got this mr scan of the brain on my whatsapp look at this subdural hematoma look at this this is a huge clot this is a huge clot here see the clot here and see the clot not only there but it is compressing the ventricle so it is compressing the ventricle and so this is an indication for surgery and he will recover completely if not operated he may develop a total hemiplegia and then the brainstem compression and coma and death 
what is not stroke now again as a clinical problem any patient with bp diabetes senior citizen if they say doctor i have got giddiness i have got dizziness transient loss of consciousness only confusion crop attack immediately you get an mr brain then and mr brain helps you to make a wrong diagnosis because there are it is running out of time i will come back to the second half because the uh, there are lacunar infarcts like graying of the hair and balding of the head there are lacunar infarcts in the brain there is an atrophy somewhere so you think that whatever the patient symptom is because of the stroke similarly isolated cranial nerve isolated diplopia dysphagia again is not a stroke stroke is a vascular territory which is affected so there will be a set of symptoms hemiplegia hemianopia dysarthria if it is a brain stem stroke something more so please remember isolated cranial nerve involvement or non specific symptoms like this is not a stroke so the pathogenesis is that uh, wherever there is a branching of the vessel because of the turbulence there is a damage to the endothelium and then there is a accumulation of platelets and over a period of time the platelet embolus to the distal artery is what causes the ischemic stroke now what are the symptoms definite symptoms to localize is a monoocular blindness not hemianopia monoocular blindness language dysfunction which automatically means there is a cerebral left sided involvement vertebro basilar as you can make out all the lower cranial nerve involvement or even cranial nerve involvement mid brain pons and the medulla diplopia dysarthria dysphagia and patients who come only for hemiparesis dysarthria hemianopia we are not sure whether it is a carotid territory or vertebro basilar territory now the stroke is categorized into large vessel and a small vessel and a cardioembolic and sometimes we don't even know why so it is a cryptogenic what is the idea large vessel can be dealt with mechanical thrombectomy if iv tpa doesn't help the small vessels are called as lacunar infarcts these are deep penetrating vessels occluding due to microatheroma so which we will come to it a little later 20% of strokes are due to cardioembolic problem the commonest is the atrial fibrillation so when the patient gets admitted for hemiplegia you get a cardiac checkup done and you find the patient has a atrial fibrillation or has underlying myocardial infarction with a thrombus so all these things require anticoagulation so sometimes you don't find any of this that we call it as a cryptogenic stroke now you can localize uh, out of the three vessel it is anterior cerebral artery <coughs> middle cerebral artery or a posterior cerebral artery stroke as you know the anterior cerebral artery supplies the leg and bladder area so the patient with a hemiparesis has got more weakness in the leg than in the arm plus they have got other problems speech is very well preserved because there is no speech area in this commonest is the middle cerebral stroke where the patient has involvement of language if it is a left cerebral problem and contralateral hemiparesis now because the leg area is spared relatively so the patient has got more amount of weakness of face and upper limb rather than the lower limb aphasia if it is a dominant hemisphere posterior cerebral artery supplies the visual cortex basically so the patients come with hemianopia or a bilateral cortical blindness then they come for a total cortical blindness vertebro basilar is easiest to localize because in addition to hemiparesis the patient may have 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 cranial nerve involvement there are several syndromes third nerve here contralateral hemiplegia sixth nerve here contralateral hemiplegia there are so many names i am sure you can read the book and find out but what is more important is the practical aspects which i am going to insist on can you differentiate when a patient is admitted with hemiplegia the first step is is it a stroke i told you about stroke mimics the second is if it is a stroke is it ischemic or hemorrhagic why we are worried 
because ischemic has a treatment and fortunately 85% are ischemic. Now there are some differentiating features but they are not absolute. There are some differentiating features on which you can make a guess. Hemorrhage obviously occurs when the blood vessel ruptures. That means there should be high pressure within the vessel. That means the patient is in known hypertensive or at the time of uh, seeing the patient has got 240 by 120. So high pressure causes a rupture of the blood vessel. So obviously hypertension is very much there. And the pressure goes up further during the active phase of life. That means a patient who wakes up with hemiplegia most often has got ischemic. Whereas a person who is shouting at his assistant or shouting at somebody else and suddenly falls down with hemiplegia, so he is already hypertensive. Further rise of BP due to tension and stress can cause rupture of the blood vessel. There is a rapid evolution because the blood clot goes on expanding. Recovery occurs rapidly in ischemia because the blood supply is restored. Here you cannot remove the blood clot, so the recovery doesn't happen. In view of uh, blood clot, the blood is a highly irritative substance to the brain. Often time it is a seizure, headache and vomiting. So all these are possibility of differentiating ischemia from hemorrhage. But with the advent of imaging, this clinical differentiation may not be all that important. I was telling you about large vessel stroke and a small vessel stroke. Now small vessel strokes are these. The deep penetrating blood vessels which supply the basal ganglia, the thalamus and the internal capsule. This is the area where the person has a blockage of vessel but this is the area where all the pyramidal tracts and sensory tracts are closely packed. So it is a narrow road with a lot of traffic there. So if there is a block there, the whole thing gets affected. But suppose it is a broad two-way road. Even if one road gets blocked, the traffic can still go on. So here, even though it is a very small area of infarct, it is densely packed with the uh, corticospinal tract. So you get a major deficit. So there are three or four varieties of lacunar stroke. Pure motor hemiplegia, the commonest. Ataxic hemiparesis, ataxia and hemiparesis on the same side. Dysarthria with clumsy hand syndrome, these are all the localizations, pure sensory stroke. Important is because it is such a small area, there is no impairment of, there is no altered sensorium. So there is no altered sensorium, there is no impairment in cognition, speech and all that. It is a clean hemiplegia, hemisensory deficit. And then if you do an MR scan, you may be able to see a lacunar infarct or you may not Okay, patient has come to the casualty with the hemiplegia. So the first thing is hemodynamic and respiratory stability. The most important question, time of onset, why I will tell you about it. There is a NIH National Institute uh, Stroke Scale, Motion Institute of Health Stroke Scale, which gives you points for all this. That is to know the, assess the deficit how severe is the deficit? Instead of just saying, okay, he has got hemiparesis, hemiplegia, it will give you a scale on which you assess the deficit. Earlier days, the CT head scan was the workhorse for all strokes. The CT scan will tell you whether it is a stroke or a stroke mimic, like subdural hematoma or a tumor. If it is a stroke, it will tell you whether it is an infarct or a hemorrhage. If it is an infarct or a hemorrhage, it will tell you where it is brainstem or brain or and it will tell you what are the complications. Now we don't use CT scan because there is an intervention possible that is a thrombolysis. So we need an MR scan as a first line. But suppose you are in a district place where there is no thrombolysis. There is no need to do an MR scan. A simple CT head scan is enough. Patients come to me after one or two days with a hemiplegia. Now that I am not going to do any thrombolysis. Patient cannot afford MR scan, just get a CT scan done. If CT scan is normal, patient has hemiplegia, by default it is an ischemic infarct. If CT scan shows a clot, then it means it is a cerebral hemorrhage. The management is different. You don't give antiplatelets if it is a hemorrhage. So I think you should do a MR scan and all that if the patient comes within the window period. If somebody comes after 48 hours from a village, there's no need to do an MR scan at all because you know he has got hemiplegia. 
either it is an infarct or a hematoma which can be seen by plain ct scan so these are some of the ct scans where patient has come for hemiplegia but there will be a huge tumor here or a glioma subdural hematoma which i already told you with lot of pressure on the ventricle or it may be a cerebral hemorrhage now an mr scan those are all ct films because you can see the bone an mr scan you can see the bone is very thin but you can see the infarct very clearly this is a cerebellar infarct now this is a cerebral infarct now we do an mr scan with a diffusion weighted adc which will tell us acute infarct infarct usually detected within several minutes but time and again in practice there is a dense hemiplegia mr scan is normal next day you do mr scan there is an infarct so back to clinical diagnosis which is of supreme importance when do we do ct angio so the work horse is ct if the patient comes beyond 24 hours if it comes within 3 hours we do an mr diffusion weighted adc so there is an acute infarct then further when you want to do something you do a ct angio ct angio you are doing angio because you want to do something for the vessel directly so when interventional management is contemplated we do a ct angio or when you have to inject uh, tpa into the artery directly then you have to do a catheter angio from femoral so angiogram is done through the catheter femoral puncture when you think of thrombolysis or thrombectomy now this is a ct ct angio is a intravenous procedure where we inject a large quantity of the dye 40 ml 60 ml and the dye from the vein it goes to right atrium right ventricle pulmonary circulation left atrium left ventricle aorta then carotid artery and then it goes to middle cerebral artery by the time it reaches middle cerebral it gets diluted so you may not be able to see properly so if you want to see where the block is and you want to do a mechanical thrombectomy then you do a catheter angiography but ct angiography is more a screening procedure what is the management i think that is the most important part of the management is the thrombolysis so what is happening is there is a thrombus which has occluded a vessel right now the nearest part of the brain is a totally infarcted dead tissue nothing you can do for this but then a little more further you see the penumbra that is the area where it is neither dead nor alive it is like people who are on an island hungry there is no food they are waiting for a helicopter to drop food if you don't drop food in time they may die of hunger so it is what is happening here this penumbra is hungry for blood supply it is alive so our treatment is to remove this clot so that the blood enters this area is gone but this area is the one which can be salvaged and so a dense hemiplegia becomes recovery or hemiparesis if only this clot can be removed so that is the basis of management now how do we remove that now see this is the infarcted brain and this is the penumbra because of this is a middle cerebral artery where there is a occlusion is there core area and penumbra now as i said brain weight is only 2% but brain has 100 billion neurons i don't know how they have calculated it so accurately but it only shows there are so many neurons but important every minute you delay thrombolysis 2 million neurons are going to die permanently you may have 100 billion rupees with you but every minute 2 million billion 2 million rupees are going so if you come after 1 hour you see how much gone after 2 hours so in the stroke the management is immediate thrombolysis so there is a very narrow window for diagnosis and management so management three principles one is obviously this is blockage so you remove the block the thrombus is there you lyse the thrombus thrombolysis then till the thrombolysis is done can we keep this tissue still alive that is called as a neuroprotective measures then because there is an infarct 
there is a edema surrounding that so we will have to treat edema also. there are three principles thrombolysis neuroprotective to keep the penumbra alive and the reactive edema to be done and general measures so first is the occluded vessel the intravenous thrombolysis tissue plasminogen activator it binds to the fibrin and causes fibrinolysis that means it dissolves the clot so in uh, general uh, terms they say clot buster so you have to go to a hospital where there is a clot buster treatment is available this is the procedure we are not going to do uh, not going to the details now you give intravenous thrombolysis as I already told you intravenous means right atrium right ventricular pump so by the time the tpa reaches the thrombus it is already diluted and if the thrombus is very stubborn we call it a stubborn clot it just won't lies in spite of giving a tpa then what you have to do go to that area and then inject the tpa what is called as intra arterial tpa so if you find a CT angiogram shows a blockage, then you do a catheter angiogram and insert the catheter to the area and then inject a TPA. Then it is a larger quantity of TPA and it gets sliced. Still the clot is very stubborn. In spite of putting a TPA locally, it doesn't dissolve. Then you have to go mechanically and then take it out. So there are three types how to open up the vessel. One is IV thrombolysis. Second is intra-arterial thrombolysis, which requires a specialist catheter angiogram and a stroke specialist. And then mechanical device, again, a stroke specialist only who can do this. There are guidelines for thrombolysis and contraindications. Now, this is a uh, TPA where the patient had a block, middle cerebral artery. This is the anterior cerebral artery. The middle cerebral was blocked. So after the thrombolysis, the middle cerebral artery gets opened, so the penumbra area gets blood supply and becomes alive. Now, this is a figure of a mechanical thrombectomy. So, mechanical thrombectomy, the catheter is introduced, there is a uh, trap there where it goes and catches hold of the clot, and this clot is retrieved and taken away and taken away by the catheter. So, mechanically, you are uh, scratching it off from the blood vessel. So IV, intra-arterial and mechanical. For everybody IV, if it doesn't help, then you catheter and locally inject. If it also doesn't help, then mechanical problem. The second and third, that means catheterization, go to the middle cerebral artery, is all done by stroke specialists. When you uh, restore the blood supply, the blood rushes into the brain and it may cause hemorrhage. Usually up to 5% of them can cause hemorrhage. And that is one small risk of thrombolysis. What if thrombolysis is not feasible? Majority of our patients, they come after the window period. So naturally, the uh, thrombolysis is not possible. In those cases, we give aspirin and aspirin. I forgot to tell you about the window period. So the intravenous TPA, the window period is up to four and a half hours. That means within that period, patient must receive IV TPA. That means he should come from home, come to the emergency, get an MR scan done, alert a stroke specialist, do a catheter, and do an intravenous TPA. So within four to four and a half hours. It doesn't mean the recovery is as good as one hour. If TPA is given within one hour, the recovery is faster and complete. If you give it four hours, the recovery is slow, I mean less. So nowadays in the Western countries, they have an MR scan, I mean CT scan or MR scan in the uh, ambulance, and there only they give you the first shot of TPA to save time. So up to four and a half hours, that is called as a window period. Now, on intra-RTL, you can still extend the time up to six hours after the stroke. Mechanical device, it can go in vertebrobasilar, mechanical thrombectomy can be done even at 10 hours and 12 hours. So, slowly the time is getting extended. But remember, it does not mean the recovery is as good as if the patient is treated at the earliest phase. So, 
so if thrombolysis is not feasible that means they have come outside the window period they have come after 6 hours so then and at least it takes an hour and a half in the hospital to get everything done mr scan catheter and you know so in that case immediately you start aspirin and clopidogrel together aspirin has already told you acts within 60 minutes and lasts for 10 days there is no need for anticoagulant unless it is a cardiogenic now the second part of the story is okay we are trying to do thrombolysis mechanical thrombectomy but in the intervening period we want the penumbra to be still alive so are there any protective agents to prevent the alive to the infant unfortunately there are no protective agents till today though a lot of protective agents are given all of you know that all these things city calling village calling whatever adorwan you have to give every day one week second week cerebralizing none of them none of them have got any proven benefit as a protective agent they are all waste of money the third part is the cerebral edema any injury causes edema suppose you have a hit here next day you will find there is an edema so twist the ankle next day you will find an edema swelling so also any insult to the brain injury or infarct causes edema and the edema adds to the problem because that again cuts off the blood supply and it may also act as a space occupying lesion and please remember edema peaks on third to fifth day so a patient is admitted with the right upper limb weakness under a neurologist i tell them next 48 hours is very important in spite of our treatment he may develop a total hemiplegia because the stroke may worsen if he comes out of the window period and edema peaks around 48 hours the person who is conscious at admission becomes unconscious under the care of a neurologist now that is because of the edema the edema is a cytotoxic edema and anti edema measures the best is the hyperosmolar mannitol many times i find the mannitol is connected and then they go away it takes about 6 hours for the mannitol to run that is not anti edema the anti edema measure the mannitol should be finished preferably in 30 or maximum 45 minutes so the 100 ml 20% mannitol should go within 30 minutes then only it has anti edema effect sometimes we use hypertonic saline steroids are of no use for edema very important if the edema is compressing the brain and patient is losing consciousness because it then presses on the upper brain stem so a patient who is fully conscious under dense hemiplegia after 3 4 hours is becoming unconscious that is the time where the mannitol has failed you allow the brain to expand outside rather than inside causing the brain stem compression so you remove a large part of the cranial vault and the brain swells outside so the brain stem is not compressed remember craniectomy is done to save the life not to improve hemiplegia this must be told very clearly to the relatives because they think the oh, brain operation is done but patient is still hemiplegic so i think it is very important that we are saving the life but not the quality of life the general measures the very last part of the talk is about the general measures which are extremely important but often neglected there are little things but each little thing with meticulous attention helps to solve the brain function the most important is glucose neither hypoglycemia nor hyperglycemia you should maintain the blood sugar within the range of 80 to 130 If there is more than 200 give insulin avoid dextrose infusion never give dextrose because glucose if you give it is inimical to the tissue so naturally the infarct area becomes more damaging anaerobic glycolysis takes place there producing lactic acid which causes more damage to the brain so avoid dextrose and hyperglycemia now lot of controversy about blood pressure because normally the brain has its own built in uh, mechanism where irrespective of the systemic blood pressure the blood pressure to the brain is maintained now that effect is gone 
once there is an infarcted tissue. So you can see patients with 220 by 140 in the OPD perfectly normal. Because the blood supply to the brain, the blood vessels constrict, it doesn't allow the systemic pressure to be transmitted. We have seen patients with cholera, dehydration, no pulse, no BP. The patient is fully conscious because the blood is all going to the brain. Now that mechanism, the built-in mechanism is lost once there is a damage to the brain. So the blood supply to the brain in the infected area depends on the systemic blood pressure. So generally we don't reduce the blood pressure unless it is more than 220 by 120. Gradually after 24, 36 hours we can reduce the BP. No intravenous fluids, excessive fluid, it only gives standard processes, give 50 to 100 ml saline per hour. Another important point, temperature. With 1 degree centigrade rise in temperature, there is an increased metabolism of all the body and also the cerebral metabolism. Now that cerebral metabolism, already the brain is suffering from lack of blood supply. Now you are asking the brain to perform more activity by increasing the cerebral metabolism. So the recovery process is gone. So the important thing is to reduce the temperature with antipyretics, not antibiotics, antipyretics, very important. There is no point in giving oxygen supply. Oral intake, don't start oral intake unless you see for yourself what the patient has got normal swallowing function. Until then, the Rhine's tube feeding to be done. Antibiotics, a good ICU will not give prophylactic antibiotic. Only if the patient develops an infection, we give antibiotic, no prophylactic antibiotic. No prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs unless there is a seizure. Prevention of deep vein thrombosis with uh, low molecular weight heparin or compression stockings. Where possible, no indwelling catheter in a male, probably the condom catheter is sufficient or if necessary intermittent catheter because indwelling catheter means infection. So it needs to be emphasized that general medical management is as important as high-tech neuro intervention. And so secondary prevention, most of you are aware of it, modifiable hypertension, diabetes, homocysteinemia, non-modifiable, nothing to worry about. Stroke in young has got a different uh, picture altogether, hypercoagulable states, sickle cell disease. So in other words, stroke in young is a different cup of tea, which you will have to uh, investigate in a different way. So prevention, as I told you, aspirin, protodogrel, statin, followed by only aspirin, 150 mg lifelong. Why for three months? That is a time when there is a high risk of uh, recurrence of stroke. Now a final one, carotid stenosis, when to intervene? Now first thing is an appropriate artery stenosis. Patient has a left hemiplegia, it is a right carotid artery which is stenosis. Often times right hemiplegia, right carotid artery, it is asymptomatic stenosis. And you are doing an intervention to prevent another stroke, not to improve this stroke. So to prevent another stroke, the patient must be fairly independent in his activities of daily living. Maybe even with a walking stick, he is able to walk, he is able to talk, he is able to eat. He is having an independent existence. If the patient is bedridden with hemiplegia, even if he has got 90% stenosis of the appropriate artery, it is not going to help. Because already bedridden, what are you preventing? When should you do? You should do within two weeks after a TIA or a mild stroke, because that is the time there is a risk of second attack. If somebody comes to me after six months of hemiplegia with 90% carotid stenosis, there's no point in doing because best medical management is better than carotid intervention. So that is why we don't do anything beyond six months. Which one? Endotrectomy or stenting? It is like ischemic heart disease. You don't see a BG or a stent. Obviously, endotrectomy is more uh, uh, long-lasting. Where it is not possible, endotrectomy we can do a stenting. Should we do anything to asymptomatic carotid stenosis? Highly controversial. I won't advise at all because in the best of the hands, 3% of them develop the hemiplegia. So somebody walks in, you diagnose asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Why? 
patient has giddiness, so you got a carotid Doppler gun, and it shows 80% stenosis. Hey, come on, you are likely to develop a stroke. You will get an endotrectomy done. He goes into the theater, comes out with hemiplegia. In the best of the hands, it can happen to anybody. So it's a very, very important decision to be made by the doctor and the patient. The last thing is a public education. What we are doing is a FAST fast. That means we tell the public that whenever the face is uh, abnormal on one side or there is a weakness of a hand or a leg or the speech is affected immediately, immediately 999 there, here it is 100, it is a brain attack and go to the nearest hospital. Hemorrhage, I am not uh, doing it. Now, what is the message? Identify the stroke. Please, this is very, very important. Identify the nearest hospital where acute stroke management is available. Definitely TPA must be available. Plus minus thrombectomy mechanical. Don't say that XYZ doctor, XYZ hospital is very good. I will refer my patient there. By the time the patient reaches in the Bangalore traffic, three hours is gone. So right now when you go home, for your sake, for your family's sake, for your friend's sake, identify the nearest hospital which has got at least thrombolysis. With thrombolysis, there is a stroke unit where the patient mechanical thrombotomy is done very good. And tell them that you go straight to this hospital. Don't send to a diagnostic center to confirm. Send to a, another specialist to confirm. No. Because time is very precious. Every minute, 2 million neurons are dying. So this is the most important message I am giving. All over the world, even in the Western countries, only about 10% of potentially eligible patients receive TPA. Either lack of knowledge or lack of funding or inability to reach the hospital within that time. So it is important to educate the public about stroke. Whenever there is a problem, go to the nearest hospital which has a stroke specialist or at least hospital has a TPA which is given. So I think this is the final and most important message for you.